Hello again. My name is Insomniac, and since I've started playing the game, my main role has always been that of the damage dealer. However, there are many things that I didn't know for a long time, and I wish someone had told me when I started out. This beginner's guide is meant to give you an overview on how to get started as a fresh TD, and also how to go about playing the role of the damage dealer. Since this is a beginner's guide, I will not go too much into detail. Of course, there is much more to being a DD, but this video will just cover the basics. So let's get straight into it. First off, what is your role as a damage dealer? As the name already suggests, your role is to deal damage. Sounds easy enough, but of course there's a lot more to it than just spamming buttons. A big part of being able to deal sufficient damage is to keep yourself alive. If you are dead, you can't fight, and if you can't fight, you can't deal any damage. Important things to look out for are heavy attacks that target you. Heavy attacks are hard-hitting attacks that might even one-shot you if you do not dodge or block them. They are displayed by the game with yellow lines coming off the enemy, and they're only visible to you if you can actually get hurt by the attack as well. Usually your tank will keep aggro of the enemy, but a heavy can slip through from time to time. So stay alert and pay attention to the animations and hints the game is giving you, so you're ready to dodge or block the attacks. Sometimes enemies perform dangerous attacks that can be interrupted as well, by bashing. Always be ready to interrupt. The faster, the better. You can see an enemy needs to be interrupted if they have red lines coming off them. Also, look out for red AoE. Never stand in them, since they will cause you unnecessary harm and your healer is going to thank you for reducing the incoming damage. To be able to make AoEs more visible, I highly recommend turning up the brightness in the gameplay tab of your settings and to change the hue to something you can see on any terrain, like for example a bright pink. Another tip is to not lose your cool if anything is aggro to you. Don't run away from your group. It would mean leaving the reach of your healer, and it would also mean leaving the reach of your tank who could take whatever is chasing you off you. Instead, lead them to your tank so he can CC them, chain them or taunt them. A very important part about staying alive as a damage dealer is also your positioning. Correct positioning will not only help you take less damage and receive more heals, but also benefit your damage because you will receive more buffs. Usually your tank will try to face the enemy away from you, so you are safe from any kind of cleave or cone attacks. Make sure you never stand next to or behind your tank to avoid getting hit by collateral damage, and instead stand at the boss's back where it's safe. Ideally, your healer will be behind you. This way, they can reach you not only with heals, but also with important buffs to increase your damage. Of course, being ranged will give you a lot of freedom to move, but in the end you should never stay behind your healer, if you still want them to be able to reach you properly. Additionally, some skills, classes and CP benefit from flanking, which means hitting the enemy from behind or from the side. Due to this, you will further increase your damage by staying behind the enemy and in front of your healer. As already hinted at earlier, positioning is a little different depending on if you are melee or ranged. As a melee DD, you won't have to pay as much attention to your healer's positioning, since you are close to the boss anyways. However, you are in a much more dangerous spot, since AoEs around the boss, coming from the boss, are more likely to reach you. Stay extra alert and always preserve some stamina to dodge to safety. As a ranged DD, you are often already out of reach of those types of AoE, but some bosses have kite mechanics that specifically target the furthest away target. So being out of position can cause the boss to start charging at you. You can stay at a safe distance to the boss, but make sure you aren't behind your healer. You can of course always help out by using heals, shields or resistance buffs yourselves. Which ones are available to you will of course depend on your class, but as a stamina damage dealer, you will always have access to vigor from the Alliance War Assault skill line, which is unlocked and leveled up through PvP. And as a Magicka DD, you will always have access to the shield from your light armor skill line. Some abilities, like the Nightblade Swallow Soul or the Magicka Templar Sweeps, also have a healing component attached to them, as long as you are dealing damage with them. Sometimes you can also save yourself by block casting. If there's heavy damage or stuns coming in, you can hold block and still cast abilities, so there's no need to stop doing damage. Simply hold block and keep on going. The only thing you can't do is slide or heavy attack while blocking, or cast abilities with a channel or cast time. So watch out if you're a Templar DD with jabs or sweeps, or use skills like rapid strikes that will cause your character to drop block. Now with how to stay alive out of the way, we should look into building your damage dealer starting off with skills and buffs you should always use. Of course skills are dependent on your class, and every class has essentials that have to be used if you want to be efficient. 
but there are still certain things that apply to every class and to magicka and stamina alike. The first skill you need on your bar is the so-called spammable, so the ability you will use the most and whenever there's nothing else to reapply. Every class has their own option for spammables, but there are also spammables and weapon abilities for both mag and stam and for every type of weapon. Examples for weapon spammables are lethal arrow for bows, force pulse for destruction staves, Wrecking Blow for two-handers. Rapid Strikes for dual wield. After adding one of those abilities, the rest of your bar is usually filled with important class abilities, which depend on what kind of DD you play, and with other abilities, which are the most useful to you. Sometimes they can be there just for passives, like the fighter skills Camouflaged Hunter or the Mage skills Inner Light. When setting up your bars, keep in mind that the Warden Spare and Sorg Summons have to be slotted on both bars or you will unsummon them on bar swap. With this in mind, let's move on to buffs. The first buff you always need to have in your loadout is Minor Force. Minor Force will increase your critical damage by 10%. This is pretty significant. No matter if Stamina or Magicka and no matter what class, you should always have a way to get Minor Force in your toolkit. There are multiple ways for you to obtain this buff. For example, Barb Trap from the Fighter Skill skill line. This skill lets you place a long-lasting trap on the floor. As soon as an enemy steps into it, it snaps and grants you minor force for 18 seconds. Make sure you pay attention to if the trap actually snapped or not. Another option is Channeled Acceleration from the Psychic Order skill line. After a 1.3 seconds cast time, the skill will give you minor force for 36 seconds. It is commonly used by Magicka damage dealers in dungeons, trash fights or fights that include a lot of movement. Stamina damage dealers also use it sometimes on range builds for trash or if there's just too much movement involved to make track usable. You can unlock this ability by leveling up the Psychic Order skill line by doing the quest line for it. You can gain access to the Psychic Order skill line by doing the first Somerset story quest, the Queen's Decree, until reaching Arteum and then talking to Loremaster Celerus in the tower. Other than skills, there are also gear sets that can grant minor force. A magical option for this would be the Medusa set from the Arx Carinium dungeon. As long as you are wearing the set, you will always have minor force, which means you won't need to use any skills that provide it. Just keep in mind that Medusa is a heavy set, which means if you wear body armor pieces, you will hurt your crit, sustain and penetration by losing light armor passives, which would drastically decrease your damage. Because of this, Medusa is usually used as a weapon and jewelry. This way, the weight of the set doesn't matter. A stamina option would be Zogvin's Warband from the Frost Vault dungeon. While wearing it, you build stacks by doing critical damage. At 10 stacks, you will gain Minor Force. This means when wearing the set, you can also drop any abilities that provide Minor Force, since the set already takes care of it. It is a popular option for bow builds. Just keep in mind that these stacks only last 5 seconds, so if you stop doing damage to the enemy for 5 seconds, you will lose your Minor Force and have to rebuild your stacks. The next important buff I will talk about is Minor Berserk, which gives you a flat 5% damage increase on everything you do. Usually this buff is provided by your healer with Combat Prayer, and there's another reason to always stand in front of them. If you are in a situation where you cannot obtain Minor Berserk from a healer, there are options for you to get it anyways. Both Magicka and Stamina can use the Slime Grow Monster set from Wayrest Sewers 1 on Veteran to gain the buff permanently or slot the fighter skill ability Camouflaged Hunter, which will give the buff to you for a couple of seconds every time you do critical damage to an enemy while flanking. Moving on, but staying at the topic of important buffs. Potions are absolutely essential to you as a DD. They don't only help you to sustain, but also give you essential buffs you should never miss out on. Sadly, these buffs are provided by expensive potions, but in any veteran trial, and when doing serious practice parses on the dummy, the potions should be included in your setup. The potions in question are Essence of Spell Damage for Magicka, and Essence of Weapon Damage for Stamina DD. They both provide the same buff, but one provides the Stamina version and restores Stamina, the other provides the Magicka version and restores Magicka. Both of these potions are craftable, but you can also buy Alliance Spell Draught and Alliance Battle Draught from the PvP vendor for Alliance points. Of course you can buy all of those potions from guild vendors as well. Just make sure you check if they are the correct level and give the correct buffs if you do so, to not get scammed. The buffs provided by them are Major Brutality and Major Savagery for Stamina, as well as Major Endurance. 
and major sorcery, major prophecy and major intellect for Magicka. Always look out for those three buffs when purchasing potions from vendors. When used, these potions will give you massive boosts in damage in crit as well as sustain. The buffs are so important they should be kept up 100% of the time. The only way to do this is to level alchemy and put the max amount of possible skill points into the medicinal use passive. This way you can have 100% uptime if you use them on cooldown. Overall, the buffs provided by those potions are so essential that you should find substitutes for them if you don't want to use them. This is often done for easier dungeons to save money. There are multiple ways to get those buffs by slotting abilities, but keep in mind that you will lose a skill slot if you do so, which could be another damaging ability, or a heal or a shield instead. The saved bar space is the main reason why potions are used in serious content. Magicka options to gain these buffs are Inner Light, which gives major prophecy passively while slotted, and Degeneration, which gives major sorcery while it is active on an enemy. Both of those skills are from the major skill skill line. Stamina options are Camouflage Hunter from the Fighter skill skill line, which gives major savagery passively while slotted, and Hidden Blade from the Dual Wheel skill line, or Momentum from the Two Handed skill line, which give major brutality while active. Additionally to these, almost every class has a way to gain at least one of these buffs in their class skill lines. These options can often be better, so keep your eyes open when reading through skill descriptions. Now that I have mentioned skill lines like Fighter Skilled and Major Skilled a lot, let's quickly look into how to obtain them. You can gain the Fighter Skilled skill line by entering any Fighter Skilled building and talking to the Hall Steward. Afterwards, you level it up by killing Daedra and Undead. You can gain the Major Skilled skill line by entering any Major Skilled Hall and talking to the Magister. You can level it up by collecting lore books in the world. The daily quest of each faction also levels it up a bit. Additionally to this for its passives, and for Magic DD's also for its orb skill, the Undaunted skill line is also of interest. You can unlock it in the tavern with the Undaunted NPCs of the starting city of your alliance. For example in the Fish Stink in Devon's Watch if you are a member of the Ebonheart Pact. You can level it up by doing dungeon achievements and pledges. With all of the buffs out of the way, let's get back to your damage dealer spar layout. The next essential skill is a weapon ability on your back bar that allows you to apply your back bar enchant while you are on your front bar. This may sound a little complicated at first, but to understand it you just need to know how your enchants actually work. Because of this, let's add a little intersection here and talk about enchantments. Enchantments are an essential part of your build and add a lot of damage to your setup. Enchantments are usually also the cheapest part of any setup, so the golden cliffs are the easiest gold equipment to get and can be put on weapons and armor of lower quality than gold as well to gain a nice damage boost. Two-handed weapons, including staves, give you full value of your enchant. One-handed weapons, like a daggers for example, give you a significantly reduced value of the enchant, but of course also allow you to use multiple enchants if you are dual wielding. For this, keep in mind that effects of enchants do not stack, so putting for example two fire glyphs will be wasted enchantment for one of them. Of course there are different options, for different situations, but the most commonly used glyphs are Fiery Weapon, for Magicka Damage Dealer on the front bar, Poisoned Weapon or Poisoned and Befouled Weapon when dual wielding on the Stamina front bar, although most of the time Stamina DDs use Poison on their weapons, which are more costly but do more damage and override this used glyph, as long as the weapon is coated in Poison. For both Magicka and Stamina, the glyph used on the back bar is usually the Glyph of Weapon Damage, also known as Berserker. But how are the effects of those glyphs applied? Whenever you attack on your back bar with a light or heavy attack, it will apply your glyphs effect. Taking the Berserker Glyph as an example, light attacking on your back bar would give you increased weapon and spell damage for 5 seconds. Luckily, there are more ways than just light attacks to block the glyph, so you don't need to manually keep the effect active with timed light attacks on your back bar. Glyphs are also activated if you deal damage using a weapon ability, so an ability from the weapon skill line. A lot of them have lasting effects that continue to do damage even when you switch back to your front bar. So if the ability keeps ticking, it will reapply the glyph's effect after it runs out, even if you are on your front bar. Now that we understand how glyphs are applied, we know which type of weapon ability we need on our back bar to keep the enchant of the weapon in effect. It has to be an ability from the weapon skill line that has a damage over time component. So the commonly used skills to reapply enchantments are Endless Hail for Bows, Blade Cloak for Dual Wield, Wall of Elements for Destruction Staves, and Stampede for Two-Handers. Make sure one of those abilities, depending on what kind of weapon you use, is on your back bar. 
Now with skills and buffs in place, let's look into how to actually do a rotation. Meaning, how to actually apply and use your spammable, your buffs, your area of effect attacks and the damage over time effects to get most efficient use out of your fight time. Of course, there are specifics for each class, but the basics are the same for every type of DD. There are two different types of rotations. The static rotation that follows the same patterns and uses the same skills in the same order every time, and the dynamic rotation, which is more free and doesn't follow a set pattern. Instead, you reapply skills and buffs whenever they run out, and use the spammable in between whenever there's nothing to refresh. Static rotation patterns, of course, depend on the class you play, and need to be learned by heart for every DD you want to use them on. Dynamic rotations, on the other hand, are harder to learn because you need to get used to the duration of your skills, so you can reapply them efficiently whenever they run out. Once you are used to them, however, you can apply them to every DD class and it will be easier to pick up other types of DD. The potential damage of dynamic rotations is also higher than the one of static ones, since buff uptimes suffer less from it when done correctly. As a quick recap for this, use all of your skills and buffs. If anything runs out, refresh it. If there is nothing to refresh, use your spammable. Now the most important thing when talking about your rotation is what happens in between the skills. Every time you use your skill, you need to light attack in between, no matter if you are on your front bar or your back bar. Light attacks are often underestimated, but are one of the main sources of damage in any DD's rotation. Using light attacks in between your skills is referred to as light attack weaving. Let me explain this a little closer. Skills in ESO do not have a cooldown in the traditional sense. Still, every time you use an ability, you are bound to a 1 second global cooldown, also referred to as a GCD. During this global cooldown, you are unable to use another ability. However, your light attacks do not follow this global cooldown, which means in the time you are not able to use another skill, you can still use them. Additionally, to being able to use the light attack, you can also cancel its animation by using another skill once the GCD is over. If done correctly, you will barely see the animation of your light attack, and it will still do damage. To recap this and sum it up, use your light attack and then a skill right after. The use skill will cut off the animation of your light attack, but it will still do damage. Then use another light attack while the global cooldown is in place and cut its animation short again with the next use skill once the global cooldown is over again. The overall goal is to cut the time in between your skills where you do nothing as short as possible by filling it with light attacks. The better your timing of light attacks becomes, the more of the animation you cut short. The faster you use your skills once the global cooldown is over, the lower your time lost and the higher your damage will be. The time lost doing nothing while parsing is referred to as your weaving average. Try to keep your weaving average as low as possible. Mastering light attack weaving is the hardest part of the DD role, but it pays off by increasing your damage more and more the better you get at it. Of course not all of this has to be done by guessing uptimes and measured just by assuming how well you did. There are many useful add-ons that will make your life much easier. I will give a quick overview of the most important add-ons in this next section. First important add-on to help you out with doing damage is Action Duration Reminder, or short ADR. ADR gives you a timer that shows you how long your skills will be active still, so you can refresh them when they run out without losing any time. I recommend using ADR over the base game timers that have been added with Blackwood. The next useful add-on is Combat Metrics, or short CMX. After fighting or doing a dummy parse, you can check the exact stats of your fight by opening the CMX window. This is what's commonly used to analyze parses and give feedback for improvement. Reading it properly can help you improve your own parses by figuring out where issues might be. I will be using one of my stamina warden parses as an example. At the bottom left, you can see my ID and when the parse was recorded, so you always know if it is an up-to-date parse and you can also check which patch it was from in the bottom right. On the top right you can see my total damage done. And here what kind of target I was hitting. In this case the Iron Atronach training dummy. In the middle you can see resource strain compared to regeneration, as well as overall stats like penetration, weapon damage and more. On the right side you can see all of my active buffs listed. Next to the listed buffs you can see what percentage of the parse time it was active for. This way you can see how well you for example kept up your backbar enchant or other vital buffs by scrolling through the list. Grayed out tab next to it is debuffs applied to the enemy. There you can for example check your barb trap uptime to check for minor force. Below that you can see how much damage each individual skill did, how often it hit and how many of set hits were critical. The next important part is the info window you can find here. 
In the info window, you can see all of my used abilities and gear, as well as champion points on the right. The most important bit is the top left, where your weaving average is displayed. Here you can see the average time loss between casting skills, as explained earlier, as well as how much time was lost in the parse overall. Additionally, combat metrics lists if any light attacks were missed, and if yes, before which skill. When looking at a parse from a boss fight in a dungeon or a trial, it stays mostly the same, but there is some additional information. This example is my Magicka Sorcerer on the first boss in Veteran Moon Hunter Keep. As you can see, since there were multiple targets hit, multiple targets and their individual DPS are listed on the left, as well as the overall group damage and my percentage of the group's damage next to my DPS. Another very important add-on is Code's Combat Alerts. This one is not for parsing, but for staying alive. Combat Alerts provides you with bars whenever you are getting heavy attacked that show you exactly when the attack will hit so you can dodge or block in the correct moment. Additionally, it will call out mechanics and trials and dungeons for you, making gameplay much easier. Lastly, what can be very useful to you is Dressing Room. Dressing Room lets you save different gear and skill setups so you can switch them by just pressing a hotkey instead of having to work out your gear manually every time you want to swap. I will get a bit more into different setups in just a moment. Now if you want to get into playing group content, like trials and dungeon in this game, there are a couple of more things regarding your DD and your setup you should keep in mind. Certain situations call for specific setups and some gear is more useful in places where other gear is not. For example your gear and skill setup that works perfectly fine on a dummy because it's a singular target that sits still and doesn't attack back might work very well against bosses that behave in a similar way. If you get hit a lot, however, maybe you will need a shield or a heal or food that gives you more HP than the one you would use on a dummy. If it is important you hit multiple targets, maybe you need to slot more abilities with AoE component to them. Maybe if the enemy moves around a lot, or you cannot hit it with melee abilities, you have to go with a ranged setup or something that allows for more movement. Always keep these points in mind when setting up for a fight, since they have a huge impact on your DPS in the end. A setup that gives you amazing damage in one fight can give you barely any in another, because you might not be able to actually utilize the effects of your slotted gear. Another example of different fights is comparing boss fights to pure ad fights in between bosses. Since you want to do as much AoE DPS as possible and kill them as fast as you can, boss setups usually do very little for you there. The previously mentioned dressing room add-on is amazing for switching setups quickly within trials or even dungeons. If you don't wish to switch setups, you can of course always make a setup that has a little bit of everything and works for ad fights as well as boss fights. This will make you do less damage in both situations, but be a good compromise overall. Setups like that are very nice for dungeons. A lot of classes have AoE skills in their class toolkit. Others don't, but you can find AoE abilities in every weapon skill line. Examples are Brawler for two-handed, Whirling Blades for dual wield, Acid Spray for bows, and Elemental Ring for destruction staves. Depending on if you play a Magicka or a Stamina DD, certain situations will be different for you. Stamina DDs have different demands to their supports than Magicka DDs. This means if you decide to play a Stamina DD in a group set up for Magicka DDs, you will not receive a lot of support, which will hurt your overall performance. The same thing applies to playing a Magicka DD in a group optimized for Stamina. Besides other points, this will be very feelable for your sustain, since a lot of support sets only help with one type of resource. The other part, and this is especially important to Stamina DDs in the current Blackwood patch, your penetration might not be correct for the type of content you are doing. This brings us directly to the next big point, penetration. You can imagine it like this. Any enemy in the game has armor you need to punch through in order to be able to do the full damage your abilities can do. There are many abilities and gear sets that lower the enemy's armor. Usually your supports are the ones taking care of this. Additionally, there are also passives, weapon traits and for example champion points that increase your penetration. All these values added up together are taken off the enemy's armor. So the lower the armor and the higher your penetration, the more your actual damage will hit the boss. Usually enemies have 18k armor, so you need to lower it by this amount. Of course you also don't want to waste anything on penetration if there's already enough, so you can focus on other things afterwards. After all, you cannot lower it more than to zero. So make sure you don't underpenetrate, but also don't overpenetrate. 
This is very easy for magic IDDs as long as you wear full light armor, since it gives you spell penetration per piece worn. Stamina IDDs do not get any penetration from their armor, and if they don't get sufficient help from their supports and their own setups, they will underpenetrate by a high amount which will cause a big DPS loss. Spell penetration is for magical abilities, physical penetration for physical abilities. The last thing to talk about are your food, race and mander stones. Kashid and Dark Elf are both amazing choices for DDs and work perfectly for Magicka and Stamina. High Elves are another good choice for Magicka and Orcs for Stamina. You can work with other races as well, but they will not give you the same possible damage output for PvE content. As for food, you should always have a food buff active, as it gives you resources which make you more survivable due to a higher overall HP pool and also makes you do more damage, since your weapon damage and spell damage are also getting higher depending on how big your stamina or magicka pool is overall. So more of your primary resources equals more damage. There are many different foods you can use. Very common are so-called blue bystead foods. They are very cheap and give you max HP, plus max stamina or max magicka, depending on which one you cook. They give you a good amount of resources, but no regeneration. For dummy parses and sometimes also for content, the so-called parse food is also used. For magicka it is called ghastly eyeball, for stamina lava foot soup with salt rice. Both of these will give you a good amount of mech or stem, and additionally a lot of regeneration, which makes them perfect for sustaining long fights. However, there's no HP component in this food, which makes it a lot more risky to use in combat. Other options then include some HP and regeneration as well. Max Mag or Stem are Dubious Camoran Throne and Arteum Takeaway Broth for Stem as well as Witch Mother's Potent Brew and Clockwork Citrus Filet for Mac. The first option each is very cheap, the last expensive. For starting out, I would recommend using the cheap Bystead food for Trials and Dungeons and the also very cheap Parse food for Dummy Parses. Now let's get to choosing a Mundus Stone. In the current patch, the usual choice is the Thief Mundus for a higher crit chance. If you already have a very high crit chance, this is usually the case when playing for example two crit heavy gear sets of Magicka, you can also use the Shadow Mundus to increase your critical damage. If you play a stamina character without enough support to help you with your physical penetration, the Lava Mundus is also an option for you. This concludes my beginner's guide on the role of the damage dealer in the Elder Scrolls Online. Feel free to ask questions in the comments if anything is unclear. I really hope this helped and thanks a lot for watching.